Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jan Sveinar. I am professor here and director of the Center on Global Economic Governance. And uh, I would like to thank you all for coming and joining us here today. We're very pleased to welcome you to a special program. And it's my truly distinct pleasure to welcome our honored and esteemed guest, uh, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Um, his speech uh, will focus on changing global balance and the world and how a strong and united NATO remains the best way to protect our open democratic societies. Uh, for many of you, uh, Mr. Stoltenberg needs no introduction, but let me nevertheless say a few words. Uh, he's in a great and unique position as the Secretary General to provide strong support uh, for the enhanced transatlantic cooperation including the better burden sharing across the Atlantic. His work within NATO um, has, has leader on the world stage, has really demonstrated that he views international governmental organizations as complementary and essential to securing peace and development globally. Uh, previous to NATO, Mr. Stoltenberg served as the Prime Minister of Norway. He did so twice, from 2000 to 2001, and then again from 2005 to 2013. Uh, he was member of the parliament for over 20 years, and under his leadership, Norway's uh, defense spending increased steadily, uh, with the result that Norway today is one of the allies with the highest per capita defense expenditure, an issue which, as you will hear, is, is a very important one. Uh, Mr. Stoltenberg has had a number of international assignments, including the UN Special Envoy on Climate Change. Uh, now, by offering a forum for these types of conversation, the Center on Global Economic Governance hopes to foster a more complete and nuanced understanding of today's complex world and many developing trends in the global political, social, and economic environments the aim is to develop in-depth research and actionable policy proposals and to enhance the understanding of pressing global issues and to shape political and economic debate and policy implementation. We would like to thank uh, the World Leaders Forum uh, for partnering with us to bring this event uh, to campus. I'd like to specially recognize Ambassador Donald Blinken and Mrs. Vera Blinken who support this distinguished series of lectures on global governance. And we annually, through their support, bring renowned international leaders to discuss pressing <coughs> issues uh, related to the future of European politics, economics, and foreign relations with our community. Ambassador Blinken has made a major lasting impact in uh, fields ranging from public service, um, he served as U.S. Ambassador to Hungary from 1994 to 1998. He's worked uh, in investment banking and very much also in education. Our past Blinken lectures have been delivered by people like Pier Carlo Paduan, then the Italian Minister of the Economy and Finance, Werner Hoyer, President of the European Investment Bank, the largest uh, uh, development bank in the world, Wolfgang Schäuble, who was then the German Minister of Finance, and Antonio Tajani, President of the European Parliament. So we're very much honored to have Secretary General Stoltenberg to join us to this roster of esteemed speakers and are very grateful that you will spend the time with us today. I'm very now pleased to invite you to come to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, for that uh, kind uh, introduction, and uh, uh, thank you so much also to Ambassador Donald uh, and uh, Vera uh, Blinken. And uh, let me start by saying it's a really a great pleasure and honor to be here at the Columbia uh, University uh, today. Uh, this is one of the uh, greatest uh, universities and most uh, recognized universities in the world, and therefore I really feel honored to be here. And then I also have to admit to you that I always uh, have a very special feeling when I visit academic institutions as this university, because as we spoke about uh, just before we entered this room, my uh, plan, uh, my dream has always been uh, to uh, become uh, an academic, to have an academic career. And uh, I actually made a real effort uh, many, many years ago. Uh, uh, I worked uh, with research on uh, uh, economic 
econometrics and mathematics for a couple of years, and then I was asked to become, uh, so my plan was then to really do it in, in the academic life, but then I was asked to become a deputy minister for environment, uh, and I promised myself and I promised my wife to only do that for a couple of years, and then uh, go back to some real work, some, uh, some the, the, the beauty of uh, research, but I'm still in politics, um, uh, so my academic career will, uh, as it will never take off, I think. Uh, so, uh, so if you don't study hard, you end up as a Secretary General of NATO. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, that's uh, you have to be careful. Um, uh, so, uh, so, uh, there, but, but in, also, since I'm not able to work in an academic institution, I, I, I appreciate to visit uh, them and to to see the energy of the students and to smell kind of the, the, the beauty of uh, research and academic uh, life. I will uh, be uh, relatively short to, uh, in my uh, opening remarks, but I promise that I'm, uh, afterwards I will sit down there and I will, ask, uh, and I will answer your questions and respond to uh, all the issues you would like to raise uh, with uh, me. Colombia is not only a great university, but uh, Colombia is also uh, situated in a great city, uh, uh, the city of uh, New York. And uh, New York has shaped uh, uh, the world in so many ways. It has shaped uh, NATO too. We recently marked the anniversary of 9-11 with a moment's silence at the NATO headquarters. Right next uh, to the twisted steel um, beam from the World Trade Center, which is at the entrance of the NATO headquarters. A lasting memorial to all those who died on that terrible day. And a daily reminder for all uh, who work at NATO of the enduring uh, importance uh, of 9-11 for our alliance. For when the United States was attacked, it was not alone. Within hours, uh, and for the first time in our history, NATO invoked our Article 5, our Collective Defense Clause, which states that an attack against one is an attack against all. All for one, and one for all. The way uh, our nations work together after 9-11 shows the strength of the transatlantic bond and of our forces standing together. We will also need this in the uh, future. There are many challenges, but today I will focus on three of them. Our values are under pressure. The global balance of power is shifting and new technology is changing the nature of warfare. So first, values. NATO is an extraordinary idea. To bring together nations uh, that share the same values, democracy, freedom, and the rule of law. And to unite them uh, in common cause. To maintain our collective security in light of adversaries that no one could face alone. The Cold War, as much as anything, was a battle of ideas, of values. And ultimately, it was a battle that we won. Our democratic values, and, and uh, uh, continue to be so, uh, are uh, a, a beacon to oppress people around the world. Ambassador Blinken, who was US ambassador to Hungary in the 1990s, know this uh, very well. As the Cold War came to an end, the peoples of Central and Eastern Europe were anxious to secure their new found freedom. The first major uh, step was membership in NATO. The prospect of uh, being welcomed into our family uh, helped uh, those nations make difficult democratic and economic reforms. NATO membership gave them the certainty that they were safe and the confidence to focus on growth, on the well-being of their people, and soon on membership of the European Union. Today, they are strong, independent nations, thanks in large part to the bedrock of security that comes with NATO membership. Today, our values are once again under pressure. 
We see this in our own countries, where we face sophisticated disinformation campaigns aiming to undermine our democratic processes, meddling in our democratic uh, uh, elections, and uh, cyber attacks on our governments, institutions, and uh, companies. And our values are not universally held. In many countries, people are denied the right to elect their own leaders, imprisoned for voicing their political views, and closely monitored uh, by the governments using the latest technology. Yet, from Moscow to Hong Kong, we can always see how people are willing to stand up and fight for freedom, whatever odds. This shows the enduring strength of our values. We believe in them simply because democracy is better than dictatorship, tolerance is better than intolerance, and freedom is better than oppression. A second challenge is uh, the shifting balance of power. Today, the countries of the NATO alliance account for roughly half of global GDP. 20 years ago, that figure was almost 75%. Over the next decade, China is forecast to overtake the United States as the largest economy in the world. And military spending by China has almost doubled over the last 10 years, giving it the second biggest uh, defense budget in the world after the United States. At the same time, we are seeing challenges to the established rules-based order. Russia is not the partner we once hoped it to be. Rather than following international norms and rules, uh, it is undermining them. From its illegal annexation of Crimea to assassination attempts on NATO territory. From cyber attacks uh, and disinformation uh, campaigns to supporting the Assad regime in Syria. It is also investing heavily in its armed forces, replacing its aging ships, uh, carriers, and aircraft, uh, and investing. Uh, in uh, advanced weapon system, systems such as laser cannons. We also see proliferation of um, weapons of mass destruction and aggressive and destabilizing behavior by nations such as Iran and North Korea. All of this means that to protect our freedom, we must continue to invest in our defense. All NATO allies are increasing defense spending and more allies are meeting the guideline of spending 2% of GDP uh, on their defense. By the end of next year, European allies and Canada will have spent an additional 100 billion US dollars on defense since 2016. Economically, politically, and militarily, together we are stronger. A third challenge is the rapid pace of disruptive technological, technological change. This is transforming our daily lives. Technology changes fast. We are in the midst of a new industrial revolution. Artificial intelligence, facial recognition, big data, biotech, extraordinary technologies that have the potential to revolutionize our societies. They can help us uh, solve some of our most difficult problems, curing diseases, tackling climate change, growing our economies. At the opening ceremony of uh, last year's Winter Olympics, we saw one pilot more, uh, control more than 1,200 drones in a stunning light show. The, 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 the display was beautiful, but imagine that same technology being used to cripple a state-of-the-art aircraft carrier, or even to destroy a seat of government. Some civilian technologies can be used for a military purpose, and others are being developed specifically for a military use, such as hypersonic missiles, autonomous weapon systems, and cyber warfare. All of this is changing the nature of warfare.
For 70 years, NATO's deterrence and defense has relied upon maintaining our technological edge, on being better and more advanced than our opponents. We have done this by investing more in research and development than anyone else, but today we are under fierce competition. For example, President Xi has announced plans for China to become the world's leading power in artificial intelligence uh, uh, by uh, the end of 2030, by the end of 2030. And is investing billions of dollars to make it happen. Our future security depends on our ability to understand, adopt, and implement emerging disruptive technologies. NATO has a key role to play in this transformation. It can serve as a forum for allies and partners to consider the difficult ethical and legal questions that will inevitably arise from these technologies. Importantly, NATO coordinates defense planning among nations, ensuring allies are investing, developing, and adopting the latest technologies. And it uh, creates common standards, procedures, and other means of maintaining our ability to work together in peacetime, in crisis, and when necessary, in combat. NATO was created by people who could see beyond the world as it was, towards the world as it could be, and then to act to shape the future. Back then, they could see the terrible threat posed by the Soviet Union, but they could also see the potential strength of Western democra democracies united for peace. NATO is the bedrock of our security. Its future will be determined by our future leaders, by leaders with that same ability to shape our world for the better. You will be among those leaders. And by defending our values, investing in our defense, and maintaining our technological edge, we will continue to live in a world of freedom, peace, and prosperity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Secretary Stoltenberg. This was very informative, insightful, and uh, I'm sure uh, great food for thought. Uh, why don't we follow the tradition and see if uh, Ambassador Blinken would like to ask the first question, and then we'll open it up for everyone else. We join in thanking the Secretary General for taking the time to come up here today during a very hectic week in New York and a very chaotic week in Washington and London. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question that's rather specific. What will the effect of Brexit, Brexit when it happens be on NATO? Will, will the UK continue to exercise an important role in NATO, or will, it, will there be some changes in the, the NATO structure as a result of Brexit? Thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for making this possible and also for, for, for the question. Uh, the short answer is that Brexit will change the UK's relationship uh, to the European Union, but Brexit will not change the UK's relationship to NATO. Uh, if anything, it will make uh, NATO even more important. <laughs> Uh, because NATO will then uh, become an even more important platform for bringing uh, allies, European allies, together to address common uh, political and, uh, and, uh, and security challenges. So, uh, so uh, it's not for me to comment on Brexit, but it has been clearly stated uh, by the United Kingdom from both the remainders and, uh, and those who are in favor of uh, Brexit leaving, uh, that, that they, are, they will stay committed to NATO, and if anything, uh, their, the importance of NATO and the UK commitment to NATO will uh, uh, just uh, 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 grow. Yeah. Very good. Maybe I'll use the prerogative and ask the next question, and then you'll be following me. Uh, you know, the challenges that you've outlined are uh, major indeed, and uh, uh, people sometimes ask the question whether NATO is as uh, cohesive as it used to be, you know, 
one for all, all for one. Suppose hypothetically that uh, one of the smaller Baltic countries uh, that has, let's say, a significant Russian population, um, you know, was subject to uh, overnight <coughs> partial invasion, and then Russia says, "Let's negotiate. We just needed to pacify," you know, thing. Would um, Article Five be immediately invoked, and uh, you know, uh, the a conflict would develop, or would there be negotiation? If any NATO ally is attacked, then we will invoke Article Five. Uh, the whole, the whole, uh, the core reason, the 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 the, uh, the, the main purpose uh, of NATO is to uh, make sure that we stand together, and that's the reason why we have uh, this uh, Article Five, saying that an attack on one will be regarded as an attack on all, and the and the and the whole idea of having that, uh, the Article Five. It's not to provoke a conflict, but it's to prevent the conflict. Uh, NATO's core mission is to preserve the peace. And, and we have to remember that in Europe, the kind of normal situation was conflict and war for centuries. And, uh, and since NATO was established, no NATO ally has been attacked by another nation. It's an unprecedented period of peace in Europe um, we have seen since the establishment of NATO. It's not only, uh, what should I say, NATO that uh, can be credited for that. Uh, I think the European Union has been important. Uh, uh, but at least NATO is an important reason why we have seen an unprecedented period of peace uh, in our part of the world. Uh, and, and, and the reason why we have been able to, do, to, to deliver this or to, 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 to uphold the peace is exactly that any potential adversary know knows that an attack on one ally will trigger the response for the whole alliance. And as long as that message is credible, as long as our deterrence is credible, meaning that we both have the capabilities, but also the resolve to act, and that we communicate that, then there will be no attack. So then there is peace. It's as soon as there is some uncertainty, some uh, power vacuum or some void, then there are risks. Then there may be room for miscalculations, for misunderstandings, and then suddenly you can have conflicts and war, uh, as we have seen so many times before. So, uh, so my answer is yes. So we will do what it takes to protect all allies. Then you can say this is only something I say. Well, uh, I say it. Uh, all NATO uh, leaders uh, convey the same message. It's part of our also legal binding commitment uh, in the Washington Treaty, but perhaps more importantly, we underpin that message of collective defense, of standing together, by increasing our military presence in the eastern part of the lines. Because some, some, someone asked the question, especially after Crimea, the illegal annexation of Crimea, the use of force against Ukraine, that, well, could this happen to a NATO ally? We see you, uh, Russia is willing to use force against neighbor Ukraine, so how can we be certain that they don't do the same against, for instance, one of the Baltic countries? To remove any doubt, we decided to deploy NATO battle groups for the first time in our history in the eastern part of the lines. So for the first time in our history, we have combat-ready troops in the Baltic countries and in Poland. These are combat-ready, highly trained, highly equipped uh, uh, troops together with the home uh, forces. Uh, on top of that, we have uh, the ability to reinforce, uh, uh, and you can. Uh, but 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 the main importance of these troops is that they are NATO troops. They are multinational. So the U.S. is already in in the region. U.K. is there. Canada is there. Germany is there, and even Norway is there. So uh, and all the allies are together in the Baltic countries. So there is no way a Baltic country can be attacked without triggering the response from the whole alliance. So so. Um, uh, so that's the reason why we have implemented the biggest reinforcement, the biggest uh, uh, strengthening of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War to remove any doubt about our willingness to defend all our allies. And as long as uh, we, we, we demonstrate that will, uh, no ally will be attacked. Thank you. That's powerful. Next question here. Thank you very much. We would ask if uh, audience members could come to this mic, please. Oh, so there and others can um, you know line up if you want to be the next who poses the question
Secretary General, thank you very much. My name is Valery Kuczynski. I'm a former Ukrainian ambassador. And uh, I have one big question. Uh, joining NATO is Ukraine has been Ukraine's foreign policy priority for many years. In fact, since independence, and we celebrated 28th anniversary a month ago. And uh, how feasible under the circumstances is this idea, is this quest for becoming member of NATO for Ukraine? A couple of days ago, we had a meeting with Ukraine's new Ukraine's president, Zelensky. I'm sure he asked you the same question. And uh, the uh, idea is now part of Ukraine's constitution. A couple of months ago, there was an article in Ukraine's constitution that joining NATO is a top priority. Thank you. Well, so you're absolutely right uh, that uh, I, when I met the, the Ukrainian president uh, a couple of days ago here in New York, uh, he raised the issue of uh, NATO membership for Ukraine. Uh, because, as you said, this is now part of the constitution. And, uh, and um, I was uh, present at the NATO summit in Bucharest in 2008, where we made a decision that Ukraine and Georgia will become members of uh, NATO. We didn't say anything about when, uh, because this is about, uh, 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 this is kind of conditions based, meaning that uh, any nation that wants to join NATO has to meet the standards, have to fulfill. Uh, uh, the standards we have set up to become a NATO member. Therefore, I think that the important thing for uh, Ukraine and for NATO is to focus on uh, reforms, is to focus on how to modernize, strengthen uh, uh, Ukraine's um, defense and uh, security institutions, uh, to, to strengthen the rule of law, to fight corruption, and, and, and everything we now do together with Ukrainians in trying to uh, uh, so help Ukraine moving forward towards membership. When they are ready, it's not for me to say, but I welcome the fact that uh, the government of Ukraine uh, has clearly stated that their focus is also on these reforms, and that was very much reiterated by the president uh, when I uh, met him. Uh, let me add one more thing, and that is that f for NATO it is important to convey a clear message that, that NATO's door remains open, uh, three years ago, we um, we had the Montenegro. Uh, so Montenegro became the the 29th member of the alliance, and uh, er, early next year, or in within months, we will have North uh, Macedonia becoming a member. So it demonstrates that NATO's door uh, remains open, and it's for NATO allies and applicant country to decide when a country can become member. Russia or any other country uh, has no say in that uh, because it's sovereign right of any nation to decide its own path, including what kind of security arrangements it wants to be part of. So we are supporting Ukraine, we work with Ukraine, and then uh, uh, we hope that one day we can welcome them. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, Secretary General, thank you for a terrific speech. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, my name is Daniel Goldman. I'm an alum of the college, and I work in financial technology. Can you comment on the rise in civil war, internal repression, and ethnic cleansing since the growth of the multilateral architecture and security apparatus, and uh, particularly in recent memory in uh, Syria, Sudan, Myanmar, the DRC, uh, and how the international security apparatus can be marshaled to afford greater protection to human rights, to uh, repressed populations in such environments while affording the appropriate respect for national sovereignty. Thank you. The question you ask is one of the most difficult questions we are faced with uh, as, as an international community, um, as NATO, um, uh, as, as, as a strong military alliance every day. Because fundamentally, the question is, when do we intervene? When do we use military power? 
to try to try to protect human rights, to uh, to 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 defend democracy, to uh, to try to uphold our values. And when do we just stay out? Uh, because this is about respecting uh, also the sovereignty, uh, integrity of uh, nations, also when they uh, violate fundamental uh, human rights. And the reason why I say this is difficult is that we have examples where the international community has not intervened, and we have uh, seen that that was uh, uh, the wrong decision, or at least we, there have been uh, uh, doubts about whether it was right to not intervene. We saw that um, in Rwanda uh, in the 1990s. We saw it, for instance, after the uh, massacre in Srebrenica in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, uh, so then I think many people believe that we should be have more forward-leaning, we should have used military power to uphold our values, to protect human rights, to, 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 to avoid killing of thousands or uh, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of people. Uh, and then we have, but then we also have examples where we have intervened. And, 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 and I think it's right that NATO went into Afghanistan. I think it's right that we also uh, uh, took part in the military operations over Libya. But we have to admit that it's not, it's not a straight line. It's not a, it's not a clear win. It's not easy uh, uh, to obtain what we try to do, uh, to create stable, democratic societies uh, which are respecting our values. So I think that what I'm trying to say is that there are two very extreme positions, either to never intervene or to always intervene. And I think both of those positions are wrong. So we have to, we have to look for something in between, where we sometimes, based on our as I say, overall assessment, analysis of the situation, believe that the cost of not acting is bigger than the cost of acting. And then we act. But other times we, we, just, we just think that uh, we will actually cause more damage if we use military power than when we uh, uh, don't use military power. Um, yeah, so so, so uh, it, it was a quite, as I said, general question, and it was a quite good general answer, because the reality is that we have to, as a, not always as NATO, but as, a, but as an international community, the UN, uh, uh, all of us, have to, have to find a balance, which is extremely difficult, uh, but there's no way to escape that uh, dilemma. Thank you. Good morning, Secretary General. Thank you for being here. My name is Dipali Mukhopadhyay. I'm a member of the faculty here at SIPA. Uh, you opened your comments with the attack on September 11th and the precedent-setting intervention that came thereafter. I just came back from a month in Kabul where people are wondering and anxious about what the future of the US role in Afghan politics and security will be. And I'm wondering if you can share with us how in the NATO leadership and among the members you think about what the future role of the alliance will be in Afghan security and politics if and when the US itself uh, pulls back its presence. Thank you. I think your question is actually very linked to the previous question, and it highlights uh, the difficulty of using military power. Uh, again, I believe, and I was actually Prime Minister in Norway when we uh, decided in 2001, as a, as a Norway as a NATO ally, supported the decision to invoke Article 5 and to send also Norwegian troops into Afghanistan. And as Secretary General of NATO, I have been extremely supportive of the NATO military presence in Afghanistan. Because we have to remember that the reason we went in, the main purpose of our presence in Afghanistan is to, was or has been or still is, to make sure that Afghanistan is not a safe haven for international terrorists. A country where they can plan, uh, prepare, organize, exercise terrorist attacks on our countries. As we saw 9-11 in the United States, but also as we have seen uh, uh, different places in the, in the world. And, and our military presence in Afghanistan, uh, there are many problems, many challenges, there's still violence, there's not stabi stability. We struggle with a, a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, also tasks in, uh, in Afghanistan, but at least we have, together with the Afghans, made sure that Afghanistan is not a safe haven for international, uh, international terrorists, as we saw before 2001. Um, then our military presence there is to create the conditions for a political solution. So, so we will not stay longer than necessary. 
And that's also the reason why NATO and I strongly welcomed uh, the US efforts to find a political solution. The negotiations that have uh, taken place between uh, the United States and Taliban in close consult consultation with all NATO allies because we are there together. Um, uh, and, and we will also welcome the assumption of peace talks because they, they, they are now, um, also they, they were ended uh, some weeks ago. Um, but to have a result, to have a, a deal, uh, the Taliban needs to show real willingness to make real compromises and to go into an agreement which in a credible way makes sure that uh, Afghanistan uh, doesn't once again become this safe haven for international uh, terrorism. So we believe that a good deal is more important than a quick deal. Uh, and we also have to understand that we have already fundamentally changed our military presence in Afghanistan. Not so many years ago, we were more than 140,000 troops in a big NATO combat operation. Now we are roughly 16,000 troops uh, in a mission which is mainly focusing on training and advising the Afghan security forces. So it is the Af Afghan security forces which are on the front line uh, uh, fighting Taliban. We help them, we support them. Uh, but we are not in a big combat operation anymore. We are in a more uh, train assistance wise uh, mission. So, um, so, uh, so, so, yeah. So, so, so we will stay, uh, but we will, sc uh, but we will also then work for a political solution. Um, and we strongly believe that our military presence is cr is 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 trying to create the conditions for a political solution. Taliban has to understand that they will not win on the battlefield. They have to sit down at the negotiating table and making real compromises. Uh, um, uh, but to create those conditions, we need to maintain our military presence. Hello, I'm Cynthia Roberts, a research scholar and adjunct professor here. I teach European Security Seminar. I'm spending the year, uh, my sabbatical year, at the Joint Staff in Washington, where I recently had the chance to go and speak at NATO. So uh, my question is, um, in an extraordinary development um, after the Russians violated the INF Treaty, the United States under President Trump, as you know, uh, decided to give notice and then withdraw from the treaty. And what was really extraordinary was that NATO members unanimously supported this decision. And given different politics, given different views on security and foreign policies, this was um, really uh, a surprising development in some ways. In other ways, not so much because it, after 30 meetings with Moscow, it was clear that the Russians were not going to um, change their behavior and uh, remove the violating missiles. So my question is, uh, given uh, the trends in Russian military capabilities um, and your many statements that NATO's response will not include new nuclear weapons. Um, um, I'm wondering whether uh, you will uh, promote more development of conventional capabilities, or whether you assess that the politics of this will make it too difficult. For example, um, new kinds of, uh, not new kinds, but actual conventional ground-based missiles that might help the US reinforce NATO and protect uh, the landing bases and so on. Thank you. First of all, the demise of uh, the INF Treaty is something we all uh, uh, regret so very much because the INF Treaty, which was signed in 1987, has been uh, a cornerstone for European security and global security. It didn't reduce the number of weapons. It, it, it banned a whole category of weapons. It banned all uh, intermediate range uh, land-based uh, weapon systems uh, globally. Uh, and therefore, it has served our security for decades. It was signed by uh, President Reagan and President um, Gorbachev, or, um, Gorbachev in 87. Uh, now that uh, treaty has ceased to exist, and the reason is the, violation, the Russian violation of the treaty. Russia started to deploy new uh, uh, ground-launched uh, intermediate-range uh, missiles several years ago. Um, this uh, was first raised by the Obama administration, um, uh, and then in many meetings, as, as you referred to. 
uh, then uh, the new uh, Trump administration continued to raise their concerns and call on Russia to come back into compliance. All NATO allies uh, did the same. Uh, so we gave Russia actually several years to come back into compliance. They didn't do so. Uh, and therefore, there was no way that this treaty could uh, continue. Because a treaty, an arms control treaty, which is only respected by one side, doesn't deliver security. And, uh, and I regret that very much because I'm, I'm part of the political generation in, in Europe, which actually was very much shaped by our understanding of security policy, it was very much shaped by the deployment of intermediate range nuclear weapons in Europe in the 1970s and 80s, something called the SS20s uh, and uh, 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 NATO Pershing and, uh, and, uh, and cruise missiles. So it was a really great achievement to have a treaty banning all these weapons. Um, uh, and, 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 the, and, and the good thing is that all NATO allies agree that Russia has violated the treaty, um, uh, and all NATO allies also has supported the U.S. position that a, a treaty which is not respected by both sides doesn't work, so therefore we support the decision also to start the withdrawal process and then uh, leave the treaty. What we are doing now is uh, that we are uh, then working on the response. Uh, we are looking into different uh, uh, measures, uh, including conventional. I'm, I'm, I'm not able to. Uh, I'm, it's too early for me to, 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 what should I say, conclude that uh, and to tell you exactly what we'll do. But we are looking also into different uh, uh, conventional options. Uh, we are uh, working on air and missile defense, and because these are cruise missiles. And, uh, and the Russian missiles are cruise missiles, and of course our air and missile defense can also uh, uh, be part of the answer. Uh, we are looking into the readiness of forces, uh, uh, better intelligence, uh, uh, early warning. And then let me add that the Russian deployment of new uh, nuclear capable missiles in Europe is part of a pattern of Russian behavior over the last years. So we have a pattern which we have already started to or, or which we have already responded to. With the battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance, we have tripled the size of the NATO response force. We can reinforce uh, if needed. And the fact that also allies are now investing more in defense, more exercises, uh, also increasing in general our uh, readiness and the capabilities of our armed forces. Uh, um, what we have said is that we will be coordinated. We will uh, respond as an alliance. We will be defensive. Uh, we will not mirror what Russia is doing. Uh, uh, we don't have any intentions of deploying new nuclear capable missiles, but of course we have to make sure, <coughs> excuse me, that we have credible deterrence and defense also in the world with more Russian missiles in Europe and without the INF Treaty. So, so we will respond, uh, respond, but we will respond in a measured and balanced way. Thank you for coming and sharing your insights. Uh, my name is Nathan Ren, and I'm a first year student here studying international security policy. I can only hope my academic aspirations accidentally derail me into being the president of Norway or uh, NATO Secretary General. Um, you mentioned cyber attacks and the changing technological landscape as a primary challenge for NATO. Because of the increasing difficulty in accurately attributing or tracing these cyber attacks to their original source, how cautious does NATO need to be in invoking Article 5 in the event of a major attack on a member state's infrastructure or civilians? In other words, is there a specific degree of cyber attack that crosses a threshold for NATO to be considered a declaration of war? So first of all, uh, you are pointing at something which is extremely uh, important and also difficult. Uh, we have decided that a cyber attack uh, can trigger Article 5, uh, meaning, meaning that we regard cyber attack, attacks as potentially as damaging and as, as uh, dangerous as uh, conventional attacks or, or any other attack. Um, uh, so we have clearly stated that a cyber attack uh, can trigger Article 5. Then we will never give our potential adversaries you know, the advantage of specifying exactly what triggers Article 5. They have to live with the amb ambiguity that we decide when we trigger Article 5. Uh, but we send a message that if we see so serious cyber attacks, then we we have the right uh, and 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 we have the resolve and we and we have declared that then we can also respond and 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 trigger the full response from the whole alliance, not necessarily in cyber. It's up to us to decide how we respond. 
So of course we can respond to a cyber attack in cyber, but we can also respond to a cyber attack in all other domains. We have now established cyber as a military domain, as alongside we have land, sea, air, but now we have also land, sea, air, and cyber. Uh, and, and that depends on the situation, depends on, on what we regard uh, to be the best way to respond. Uh, but then you are pointing at something which is difficult, and that is attribution. Uh, because attacks in cyberspace are often hard to attribute. For me, that highlights uh, two things. First, that we need to have maximum protection of our networks. So regardless of who are attacking us, or uh, regardless of to what extent we're able to attribute, we are able to protect the networks. Uh, uh, second, we need to improve our intelligence, our, our, our procedures, our, our tools to attribute. Uh, because attribution is extremely important uh, if you're going to respond. Because then you know the, the problem with cyber is that you partly, partly don't know that you are under attack. Uh, 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 you may also only know it after the attack has taken place for, for a long time. And uh, you don't always know who are attacking you. The last thing I say about this is that attribution is not a problem only for cyber attacks. All NATO allies or uh, NATO allies um, uh, agree that uh, Iran uh, was behind the uh, conventional attack on the uh, oil facilities in um, in Saudi Arabia, but of course there has been some discussion about attribution. So, 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 so attribution is a problem uh, not only related to cyber, because uh, many aggressive nations or organizations would try to disguise that they are behind the attack. So intelligence, situational awareness, uh, high readiness, uh, and also the ability to protect uh, regardless who is attacking you are at its part of the answer to uh, cyber. Thank you. If I may, we're coming nearing an end, but maybe to extend this question, uh, to what extent has NATO been surprised by the severity and sophistication of the cyber attacks, or to what extent does NATO have superiority <coughs> in that area, similarly to land, sea, and air in the more conventional way? So I will not say that we are surprised, uh, because we have the best experts in the world, and they are studying and following this every day, and, and, and they follow the development of uh, different cyber technologies. I have seen myself how advanced some of our intelligence communities are in actually tracking what is going on uh, in cyberspace. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's good to see uh, the quality and the skills and the competence of these uh, people. Uh, uh, and especially in some of the big uh, NATO allied countries, they're really uh, top quality and big capacity uh, to track and to analyze uh, uh, cyberspace and of course any kind of aggressive actions. Uh, having said that, I think we have to admit that the challenge with cyber is that when it comes to conventional uh, attacks, that's something we may see in the future. Cy and, and, we prepare, and we prepare for something that, that as a, is a kind of theoretical possibility in the future. Cyber attack is happening every day. Different levels, different degrees, and, and, and in NATO allied countries and in NATO we, we deal with cyber incidents and, 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 and attacks almost on a daily basis. So it's not a kind of theoretical potential threat in the future, it's an ongoing thing. And cyber attacks, as you all know, can be conducted or done by states, but also by non-state actors. Uh, so it's a kind of ongoing uh, challenge. Uh, we are advanced and, and we help each other. Uh, we have a center of excellence for cyber, um, NATO center of excellence in Tallinn, which are organizing the biggest exercises in the world, bringing NATO allies together, increasing awareness, and constantly developing and strengthening our uh, 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 tools to deal with uh, cyber threats and cyber challenges. I also have to tell you that we have developed what we call sovereign cyber effects, uh, which is uh, often called offensive cyber. And uh, for instance, in the fight against Daesh, and uh, that uh, has proven to be extremely important. To be able to take down, to go into the cyber networks of an adversary. 
and, and in the fight against Daesh to, to take down their systems uh, uh, to, 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 because they use cyber to recruit, to mobilize, to finance, uh, to, to spread their propaganda. And we, NATO allies, used offensive cyber or uh, uh, national sovereign cyber effects uh, to, to go into the systems of Daesh. So this is very much about defending, but also sometimes actually about using offensive cyber. Then I think it was one guy over there. <laughs> Only if there's time. Um, it's a lot of time. Okay. Right. Right. Um, Mr. Secretary General, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name's Aidan Berkey. I'm uh, also a first year student at SIPA. Um, my question is about the Arctic, um, and specifically as um, as global warming leads to increasing um, you know, naval uh, traffic up there and increasing ac um, <laughs> increasing potential access to the resources on the Arctic seabed. We're seeing um, increasing interest in the region um, from um, most, um, most importantly from Russia, which is you know, very aggressively building up its uh, terrestrial, naval, and um, aerial capabilities in the region. What is NATO's vision of the you know, Arctic Ocean in the 21st century, and uh, you know, what uh, capabilities are necessary in order to um, you know, see that through? Uh, I think the reality is that we don't have so much time, so I'll try to be uh, brief. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I can briefly say that the, the Arctic has always been important, but the importance of Arctic, uh, the Arctic is increasing. Uh, partly because the ice is melting, uh, and partly because uh, we see that there are a lot of natural resources up there. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and partly also because we have seen uh, increased interest uh, and presence of Russia, but also of China and other countries up in the Arctic. Uh, so, of course, NATO has to find, again, a balanced way of addressing this. We are investing now in capabilities uh, which are also enabling us to increase our presence in the Arctic with uh, ships, with planes, with, uh, with uh, submarines, maritime capabilities, uh, because the Arctic is mostly sea. Uh, and uh, especially when the ice is melting, it's more and more sea and less and less ice. Um, so, uh, so we are increasing our presence, but, but I strongly believe in what has been a kind of message for decades, that in the high north, we should strive for low tensions. And in the high north, we have a unique cooperation also with Russia. Uh, on search and rescue, on, environment, uh, on environmental issues. So, so yes, we need to be present, but we should really work for uh, keeping tensions down and, 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 and continue to uh, work with Russia in the framework of the Arctic Council, but also the Barents Council, uh, where we have proven able NATO allies uh, to work with Russia for decades. And I think that's extremely important that we try to continue to do so, to protect the environment, uh, to to protect our own also common interests, and therefore uh, dialogue with Russia is important as we also see their increased presence. I think that's uh, the end of my academic career today. I think, I think, I think on the contrary, I think we have to thank you for an extremely stimulating uh, presentation. And I think if you wanted to restart your academic career, there is always time. So <laughs> let's thank the Secretary General.